All right, now that we've learned a little bit about uh, the different types of bone fractures that can occur within the skeletal system, now we're going to talk a little more about how they're, they are repaired. So keep in mind that you're um, in contrast to the dense regular connective tissues that you have in your ligaments and your tendons where you have a poor blood supply, you actually have a very rich blood supply in bones. Your osseous tissues are have plenty of blood vessels available, so your bone is a living, active type of tissue, which is uh, kind of in contrast to the impression we generally have about our bones. All right, so when you have a bone fracture, the first step, there are four major steps to repair of a bone fracture, and the first one is formation of a hematoma, as you see here on the diagram. Hematoma is just another term for a blood clot, so whenever you break a bone, like you see there, you're going to have uh, blood vessels that get ripped open, and that triggers the blood clotting process. And so that's going to be the uh, first step in bone healing. You've got to stop the blood loss and kind of close off that broken area there. Bone breakage is going to trigger inflammation. The area is going to become inflamed. So in the surrounding areas over here, you're going to have tissue. Uh, you're going to have fluid that comes out from the blood vessels as inflammation is triggered. You're going to have swelling that occurs in the injured tissues that's going to press on nerve endings and you're going to, your brain is going to um, interpret those pain signals. And so a bone breakage is going to be extremely painful if you've never broken one. <clears throat> All right, so then the next step that's going to have to take place is the Blood clot is going to need to be removed. You've got dead and damaged tissues, uh, bone fragments, um, other tissue components that are, have been destroyed by the breakage, and those are going to need to be broken down and dissolved. And, um, and then what happens next is the injured area, the injured tissues are replaced with a fibrocartilaginous callus, or sometimes this is called a soft tissue callus, and that's composed of fibrocartilage, so that's kind of like hyaline cartilage, except that um, it's more fibery, so it helps resist compression. And a little bit more about what's happening here at stage two. Notice also there on the picture that the soft tissue callus or your fibrocartilaginous cartilaginous callus is wider than the original bone. It actually juts out on the side, so it'll actually have a little knot in that location. So some of the major steps for this soft tissue callus formation. Um, first, you're going to have phagocytic cells. As I mentioned, they're going to come in. You know, your macrophages are your major vacuum cleaners of your tissues, so they're going to do phagocytosis. They actually engulf your own damaged tissue parts and dissolve those with enzymes that they have on the inside. So they have to clear out the, clear out the debris. <clears throat> Within about a week, you're going to have osteoblasts in the injured area that are going to begin forming some spongy bone. You're going to start recreating the bone in the, in the area. But um, fibroblasts come in and secrete uh, collagen fibers to help reconnect the bone ends. You know, collagen is good for resisting pulling, so they're good for connecting things. But most of the tissue in the repaired area, as I mentioned, at this point will be fibrocartilage, so it's actually going to have a softer consistency than your bone would have. All right, so then those osteoblasts replace that soft tissue cartilage over a period. It takes a couple of months for this to happen, but they're going to um, replace that fibrocartilage callus with uh, spongy bone. And notice you've still got a wider area here of bone that has developed compared to the original uh, bone itself that was injured. And also notice you've got bone all the way across the medullary cavity there. All right, so this takes about two months. It's called a bony callus because it has not uh, resumed its normal original shape. And the last step of, of uh, bone fracture repair is for remodeling 
to take place. And uh, the remodeling, as we've talked about before, that's largely dictated by mechanical and gravitational forces. And um, a lot of that is still not well understood. It's thought that the osteocytes that you have in the area, the mature bone cells, you know, they were osteoblasts before, but once they became surrounded by bony matrix, they become osteocytes. Uh, they're thought to sense the stresses that are placed on the bony tissues where they're located. And then they somehow uh, signal the bone remodeling processes to take place. All right, so bone remodeling around a fracture includes you got to carve out that medullary cavity again, so the spongy bone that the osteoblast laid down in there has to be removed. And also you have osteoclasts. Well, osteoclasts, of course, are going to be the cells that dissolve the uh, spongy bone there to restore the medullary cavity. <clears throat> And then also osteoblasts are going to come in and get rid of um, that widened area of bone that you had around the uh, outsides of the, the area that was broken. The bone remodeling processes work really, really well. The final structure should resemble the original, and that goes back to Wolf's Law where we talked about how um, the shape and structure of bones is, is largely dictated by the um, amount of work that they're required to do. <clears throat> In fact, this whole bone remodeling is so good that there have been cases where, all right, so if you're studying your, hopefully you're studying your, your bone anatomy, let's say that's the tibia, that's not a very good picture of the tibia, but down in the lower leg you have the tibia, then you've got the fib, uh, fibula that's lateral. See how I warn you on the anatomy video, it's very easily easy to um, say fibia and tibula instead of tibia and fibula, and I almost did it. So if you had a severe fracture in the tibia, and let's say you, know, you had some horrible fracture, the tibia was broken up into a bunch of pieces, um, it is possible to go in and carve out damaged portions of the tibia, and you can actually cut out a piece of the fibula, which does not bear as much weight, obviously, as the tibia. You can tell that by its size. <clears throat> Come on, pen. All right. And what has been shown is that it's possible to transplant in a piece of the fibula in that area to reconnect the two uninjured portions of the tibia. And once you do that, over time, believe it or not, that fibula will grow and will be remodeled and restore pretty much the original shape of the injured tibia. So that's pretty incredible, but that shows you how well the bone remodeling processes actually work. And you can read more about that in your textbook. It's a pretty interesting topic, but kind of the take-home message seems to be it's not all that well understood. We know what happens, but we don't completely understand how and why all of that works. All right, our last topic for Chapter 6, and then we're going to be moving on to Chapter 8, and uh, we'll, where we will learn more about the joints at the, the junctures between different bones in the body. Last topic for uh, Chapter 6 here, though, we're going to talk about some homeostatic imbalances, some disorders of the skeletal system, and we'll also talk a little bit about what happens as we age.